Yeah, very good. Thank you so much for all the teachers and the helpers and the leaders. That takes, takes a lot of work. So let's prepare our hearts for our message. Heavenly Father, we do thank you. Thank you for the children. Thank you for the helpers. Thank you for the music. Thank you for your word and your words and your sacrifice. And now, Lord, open us up. We, the natural selves, the natural stuff inside of us, the sin inside of us, our nature and the world around us is not in tune with you. It's not in frequency with you. It's not in step with you. So, Lord, help us. Help us to open up our ears and open up our minds and open up our eyes so that we could hear and see and understand what you have for us. That you would mold us and shape us and change us and prepare us for what, what life is about. For how you want us to live and who you want us to be. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Palm Sunday brings all sorts of stuff. We started talking about that at the beginning with the inter introductory, introductory prayer, introduction into the service. There's, there's all of these things. The, the things that the children talked about and Anna talked about with the kids that, you know, Hosanna in the highest. There was this verbal message and visual message. Jesus was entering as a king and the scripture also says Jesus cried when he was about to enter Jerusalem. If you would have just listened, I wanted to gather you. I wanted you to listen. I wanted you to know how much I love you. I wanted you to see, but so many didn't see. Our scripture, we're going to be in the book of 2 Peter, and that is, or 1 Peter, excuse me, 1 Peter. It's almost to the back of your Bible. Um, never want to take for granted that people know where it's at, uh, but there's a Bible close to you. If you go clear to the back, if you go clear to Revelation and you start going backwards, Jude, 3rd, 2nd, 1st John, 1st and 2nd Peter are right in there. And they're small little letters. They're small little books. So uh, it's difficult to find, but we're in the book of 1st Peter. We're going to be in chapter 3 in just a moment. We're going to start with verse 15 like we have in these past couple, three, four weeks. And even that brought confusion. I'm so thankful that God is helping in the, in the sermon messages because there's no way that I, I would have, Darren would have, I'm not smart enough to do any of this. So that idea of he knew there was going to be confusion, and the scripture we're going to look at today is confusing, confusing, and the scriptures ahead of this are confusing. How do we set apart Christ as our Lord? How do we do that? What, what's it mean to, to set him apart as our Lord, as our, our authority? How, how can we do that? How can we, we be committed to him and committed to his word in a world that's often so contrary, and things that are popular are contrary, and Sometimes the, all the things inside of us, many of the things inside of us are contrary. So how do we get in touch with that? How do we get in step with that? How do we hear that frequency? How do we get a better understanding of why God allows bad things to happen? This is what we talked about last week. If you suffer for doing good was the scripture, but that kind of leads into, my goodness, there's all sorts of suffering. And if God's all powerful and if he's all good and if he's all knowing and he, know, and he can see all things, which the Bible says he can, why didn't he control what we would have controlled? Why didn't he stop what we would have stopped? Why didn't, we, why didn't he prevent what we would have prevented? And many of those don't have, questions, don't have answers here. But we know that God's good. And we know that those things about him are true. And so here, this is going to be a confusing scripture, just like it's a confusing week when we talk about this Palm Sunday and entering as a king, but going to be crucified in a few days and I'm going to be betrayed or abandoned by his closest ones, his closest friends. We, we see all that as we head into Resurrection Sunday a week from today. So we're going to get in touch with some of this and try to try to get a better understanding of God in the middle of it. That's my prayer for all of you and for me included. If we could just have a better understanding of God when we leave this room than when we walk into it. That's it. Don't don't get it confused by something that I foul up or another teacher or another mentor or another scholar. Just listen to the Word of God and let Him talk to you. That's where the clarity comes. That's where the information comes. That's where the leading comes from. So we're in, as I had told you there, we're in 1 Peter chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 15 to 20 today as we, we get into this. We only have a couple of verses left for next weekend. But verses 15 through 20 of 1 Peter 3. I would invite you to stand just as you're able to. This is out of reverence for God's word. Beginning in verse 15, Peter writes, 
But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom he also went and preached to the spirits in prison who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. You may be seated. And if a big part of you went, huh, in that scripture, me too, me too, and a bunch of scholars too, you're, you're not alone in that. There's three points in, the, in, in your bulletin, there's a one-page insert, got a great big bunch, has a great big bunch of scriptures on the back side of it, I'm not sure that all of them are on there, in fact, I'm pretty sure they all wouldn't fit, um, but on the front side, there's three main sections that we're going to walk through here. The first one is where believers go. Where believers go is the first one. Where did Jesus go? Because it said he went to preach to the spirits in prison. Where did Jesus go? That's the second point. And the last point is what believers know. Where believers go, where did Jesus go, and what believers know. Now keep a pulse on where to, what today is, is. It's Palm Sunday and Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, so keep a pulse on that. But this idea of, it just feels almost unattainable. It's just something about it, something about that whole scripture just seemed a little bit confusing, and Christianity as a religion is confusing too. It's, it's the only one. You can study the world's religions. We have many books in the library. I have books in the library. You're welcome to borrow them and read them. Christianity is unique in that everything that is required for us to do has been done. It's been done already. That doesn't feel good to our pride. Most of the other religions, all the other religions, you have to do something. You have to be better or try harder or do this or do that or follow this or follow that or say this or say that. Christianity is not like that. All of the work to make us re-acceptable to God Almighty, our Creator, all of the work that is necessary for us to maintain fellowship with our Creator again has been done on the cross. It's all been done already. All of the suffering, all of the pain, all of the sacrifice, all of the obedience, our sin inside of us, we're all sinners, all of us, our sin inside of us separated us from God because God can't be in the presence of sin other than when the Holy Spirit comes in and helps you save, helps save you. But that part, it, our sin required our death, the payment's been paid if we'll accept it. That's where it starts. That's where it started when Jesus was entering into Jerusalem. That was part of the sacrifice. That was part of that week. It all started right then and there. It's out of gratitude. Once we accept and believe, that's what Jesus did for us. The Holy Spirit moves into us and change starts happening. It doesn't make life snap your fingers and it's all better again. We don't, that's, that's not the way it works. But this idea of he saved us from separation for God. We don't even have to go into the horrors of hell or the torment of hell or the horrors of, of being separated from him. No hope, no joy, no peace, none of that. We don't have to even entertain it, one, because we can't imagine it, and two, <laughs> it's, it's available if we just do it and out of gratitude. So many times, well, I don't want to give money to the church. I don't want to do this. I don't want to serve. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to. The church will require. The church will do this. The church will do that. I hope you're not coming to this building because of the sign on the outside. Don't come for me for sure. Don't come for another speaker or music or any of that. You come to worship God because of what he gave for you, what he saved you from, what he offers to you. That's why we sing. That's why we pray. That's why we're here. That's why it sounds so silly. Well, I don't go to that church because it's too long, too short, too early. Didn't like the music. They stand up too much, sit down too much, whatever it is. Well, that's, that's immaterial. Who are you here for? Are you here for you or are you here for God? Because you should be here for God. That's, that's the whole thing. That was the whole thing that Sunday morning. You should be here for God. It's out of gratitude that we think that. Uh, there's two fill-in-the-blanks in the first part. They're, they're short. The first one 
is Christians are not working to obtain a relationship with God. We are giving and sharing and working and whatever else we could put there because of our relationship with God. It's because of that. And I, I came to Christ late in life. I was, I mean, I was 38 before I came later in life. So I was 38 before I came. So to him, I remember vividly what like, life was like before. I, I didn't forget. I mean, I know exactly what life is like not going to church, not having Christ as a, a relationship, not having him as Savior. I, I knew about him, but I didn't know him. I know, I remember. I'm not that old. I remember. Remember what that was like. So don't feel separated or singled out that way. It just means God's knocking on your heart. Return to me, return to me, return to me. We do not obey any type of thing that the church requires to earn God's approval. His son already did that for you. But the things around us, the world around us, the sin nature inside of us, those things and the, the God of this world, the devil, all of those things are going to be pushing contrary. They're all going to be, oh, wait, 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 that doesn't make any sense. Oh, you shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't go there. You shouldn't. The things we're inclined to do or accept or pursue, they're all contrary to the things that are written in that collection of 66 books we call the Bible. They're written contrary to that. It doesn't make sense to forgive your enemy. It doesn't make sense to pray for your enemy. It doesn't make sense to turn the other cheek. It doesn't, unity doesn't make sense when we can have our way. It doesn't make sense that way. We're led to believe that the things of this world are what's most important. We are led to believe that the things of this world are what is most important. We can talk all day long. Funerals are really good at this. You can talk all day long about that, but you come to a funeral and... <laughs> that the death rate is holding strong at 100% is front and center, literally. But we're led to believe that the things of this world can grant us immortality. If we could do enough and achieve enough and be popular enough and have enough, and if we could just get that one thing or that one relationship or that one possession or that one goal or that one job, then we'd be happy. But it doesn't work like that, does it? That's what the world promotes, but it's just you're just banging at the carrot in front of you. You can't, you can't get there. We're, we misunderstand why there's pain and struggle in this life. If God's so good, why is there pain at all? There shouldn't be pain at all. And we have to kind of readjust, and we have to go places we don't necessarily want to go and start thinking about, well, without the pain and struggle, I wouldn't be a very good person at all. And that's uncomfortable. 2 Corinthians 4, 17. Our light, our momentary light distress, this passing trouble is producing for us an eternal weight of glory. That's not where we wake up. That's not where we go to first thing. We think our troubles are heavy and permanent, not light and momentary. The fill in the blank here, the second one. Everything about heaven will be beyond anything that we can imagine. Everything about heaven will Will we be beyond anything we can imagine? Had a wonderful conversation. I don't know if Miss Vicky's watching online. I hope you are. Um, but that idea of, I, I met her several years ago and she called for a different matter. Um, but it got on this topic. This, this part of the message was already written. I mean, it wasn't like she, it was inspired that way. It was just, it was a reminder of, oh, here is this fantastic Christian family, husband and wife, this fantastic Christian family who's enduring extraordinary difficulties, extraordinary d pain in their life. Listen carefully. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. It is written in the Scriptures, no one has ever seen this, and no one has ever heard about it. No one has ever imagined what God has prepared for those who love Him. It's a quote from Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus walked the earth. Luke 15, 7, Jesus speaking, Jesus himself speaking. I tell you, there is more joy in heaven over one sinner who changes his or her heart and life than over 99 good people who don't need to change. What? It's a different frequency. It's a different radio station. 2 Corinthians 12, 3 and 4. Paul talking, the Apostle Paul, same one, not same one, same one who wrote much of the New Testament. 2 Corinthians 12, 3 and 4, 
Paul's talking. I know a guy. I know a man who was taken up to paradise. Another word for heaven. I don't know if he was in his body or away from his body, but God knows. He heard things he is not able to explain, things that no human is allowed to tell. We can't get our heads and our hearts around it. We, we struggle to re- maintain that mentality. We struggle to maintain that focus. We're so caught up in the things of this world. It's like walking against a current that's up to our chin. We can't hardly push against it. Sometimes we can just barely stay still before we slide back a little bit we forget things if you read any books about heaven you're going to tune into this frequency that the sights and sounds of heaven are are more real than the sights and sounds here john burke wrote a wonderful book it's called imagine heaven and some of this is in that it's just this idea that we think this is the reality and we think eternal life is something sort of smoky and fuzzy and the people that have had close to death experiences say nope that's not it it was more real there than it is here and we heard questions that we never really thought about here we heard this question what did you do with my son Jesus what did you do with my son what did you do with the life I've given you hurts a little bit don't it It like shocks us into this other place well I'd I I think I love him I mean I think I went there I think I've lived a good life but I now I don't really know well, good. It's got you thinking about it. Where believers go is somehow, some way prepared by Jesus. We're going to get to that scripture in just a moment. But where believers go is somehow, some way prepared by Jesus. But Jesus went somewhere where believers didn't go and don't go. Jesus went somewhere, according to this letter from Peter, Jesus went somewhere that believers in Christ don't go and will never go. That's part of this confusion that we're going to talk about. This is the second point. For Christ died for sins once and f- once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Then he goes into this place that's just sort of uncomfortable and preach to the spirits in prison. What? Who? He did what? Why, why is that in there? That, is, that doesn't make I don't know. I, I doesn't make any sense. Jesus went somewhere, somehow, to a place after his death, apparently, and before he resurrected and was appeared to appear to Mary, the disciples, several others, at least 500 at a time. So Jesus appears to him, but there was this sort of gap in between that, that he, that he goes somewhere. The Apostles' Creed, many of you have come from other church backgrounds, Lutheran background, Catholic background. If you read the Apostles' Creed, it, part of that it says he, Jesus, descended into hell. And so, all right, well, let's try to find that. And it, nowhere does the Bible specifically say that Jesus went to hell. I'm going to try to clarify that, and this is like two pages shorter than it was, so bear with me. The idea of Jesus went somewhere, but it's, it's hard to get a definition of hell. We, we, don't, we don't really know. We go through the Old Testament and the New Testament, and they throw out all these words, these different terms that we don't really understand. It's not just hell. There's this Sheol, and there's Hades, and there's Tartarus. I'm like, what? Where? Is, where are these places? I don't remember seeing those on a map. I mean, where, where did those come from? Tartarus is only mentioned one time. That's 2 Peter 2, 4. When angels sinned, God did not let them go free without punishment. He sent them to Tartarus. What? Put them in caves of darkness where they're being held for judgment. I, I don't get it. It's, it's hurting my head, Pastor. It's hurting my where I'm going. Peter writes, Jesus was put to death in the body but made alive by the Spirit, through whom he also went and preached to the spirits in prison, who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. <laughs> you don't know where you're going, but you're losing me. Yeah, me too. Me too. Martin Luther, church father, Martin Luther, Lutheran, Martin Luther, he writes, I do not know for a certainty what Peter means with these verses. After reading a number of scholars on this text, I have come to the conclusion that they don't know for a certainty either. I think the preacher would do well to avoid getting bogged down trying to explain this. We do not know. We don't know. I read hundreds of pages on just that one verse. We don't know. They don't know. You're going to get answers across the map. We don't know. Part of the issue is that there's a ton of questions. It leaves us with a ton of questions. See if you got all these. If you don't, fill in, you fill in some more. 
Who are the spirits that Jesus is preaching to? We don't know. Why are these spirits are in prison? We don't know. What and where the prison Peter is talking about? We don't know. What is Jesus preaching or proclaiming? We don't know. How does Noah relate to these spirits? Is this literal? Is it figurative? We don't know. We don't know any of these things. How does purgatory come in? Is this purgatory? Is purgatory one of those places of Sheol, Tartarus, or Hades? Is that purgatory? Because purgatory is this place that says, you know, you can... If you don't quite do enough confessing, if you don't accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior in this life, when you die, then you go to this other place. You go to purgatory where then you'll have a chance to be forgiven. You'll have a chance after you die for Jesus to forgive you just in case you didn't get it right in this life. And the downside of that is that's not what the Bible says. It's just not what it says. I, you don't throw rocks at me. You just have to throw rocks at the book. It's just not what the Bible says. Hebrews 7, 24 and 25. Because Jesus lives forever, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Hebrews 9, 12. Christ entered the most holy place only once for all time. His sacrifice was his own blood on the cross and by it he set us free from sin forever. Hebrews 10, 12, and 7 to 18, Christ offered one sacrifice for sin forever. There's no more need for sacrifice for sin. 1 Peter 3, 18, in our group, Christ suffered once for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Romans 6, 10, when Christ died, he died to defeat the power of sin one time, enough for all time. Luke 16 gives us the account of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man and Lazarus... Lazarus was a beggar. They die. Rich man immediately goes to this place of separation, of torment. Lazarus immediately goes up to Abraham's breast, Abraham's bosom. They can, the rich man can see him from hell, but Lazarus appeals to oblivious. He doesn't say anything or see that he sees them. When Jesus hung on the cross a week from this coming Friday, there were two thieves, one on his right and one on his left, the one was unrepentant and the one was repentant. And the one who repented, Jesus tells him, today you will be with me in paradise. That's what it says. That's what the book says. Much of this is confusing, but we can know for certain, and this is the fill in the blank. We can know for certain that all who die having accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior are eternally secure in God's hands. We can know that for certain. Of all of the confusion, we know that for certain. All who die having accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior are eternally secure in God's hands. If you genuinely accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, there is nothing that's going to keep you out of heaven. There's no future sin. There's no big mistake. There's no bad word. Nothing is keeping you out of heaven at that point. Romans 10, 9, if you acknowledge and confess with your mouth that, mouth that Jesus is Lord, recognizing his power, authority, and majesty as God, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10, 13, a couple verses after that one. Whoever, whoever, no matter what the view, no matter what the public opinion is, whoever calls on the name of the Lord in prayer will be saved. Hell is a place of final judgment. That's what it is. Hell is a place of separate, separation from God forever. But, but listen, when a Christian dies, they do not go to Hades or to Taurus or Sheol or Purgatory or Hell. They do not go there ever. The Christian goes to be with Christ in heaven. If you hear me say anything, well, other than God loves you, People have heard me say that a lot. God loves you. The Christian goes to be with Christ in heaven 100% of the time. Don't forget that. 2 Corinthians 5, 8, Paul speaking. We really want to be away from this body and be at home with the Lord. John 14, if you read the whole section, 14, 1 through 6, I go to prepare a place for you. I go ahead of you to prepare so that I can come back so you can be where I am. I go and prepare a place for you. I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. John 14, 6, Jesus keeps going after Thomas is going, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's exactly what he's saying. And those words somehow ring hollow, but I pray they don't today. So the last point, we talked about where believers go 
and where Jesus went that is so... Mm. The last point is what believers know. We don't know exactly what Jesus preached. We can't know. There's not enough information there. We don't know who he talked to exactly. Some are thinking they're fallen angels, and there's, there's some sort of this idea of prison that gets sprinkled about in the Scriptures, Philippians 2, 9, and 10. God raised him, Jesus, to the highest place. God made his name greater than any, every other name so that every knee would bow to the name of Jesus, and then he adds everyone in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. Okay, well, maybe that's a hint, but it, Christians are, are going a different place. Isaiah 61, 1, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. This, Jesus spoke this in the synagogue because the Lord has appointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim, li proclaim liberty to the captives and opening the prison to those who are bound. Now, many of you, if you lived in sin and you remember it, that's a prison too. So don't get those, those things kind of confused. Hell's, hell's bad, hell's sin too. And the same time, the same time between his death and resurrection, Jesus delivered a message. Some will say they were to spirit beings, as to the spirits. So we get that figured out. And if you're looking for a cross-reference, I'm just going to throw it out at you. It's Jude, verse 6. There's no chapters in Jude, just one chapter. Jude, verse 6. The angels who did not keep their place of power but left their proper home, the Lord has kept these angels in darkness, bound with everlasting chains to be judged on the great day. Okay. <laughs> Reset. The majority... The majority of all of the scholars that, if, if they're given an opinion to all of this, the majority of those scholars say that Jesus went to the place of the dead to proclaim victory over all evil. That's why he went. That's what he proclaimed. And we don't know exactly what he said. We don't know what sermon it was or what the message was. But he was there to proclaim victory over all evil. And that's what he is for you too. And that's what he is for me too. He's there to proclaim victory over all evil. That's, that's why he came. Jesus' victory over death proclaims his full lordship over all, and the Apostle Paul talks about this in Romans 8, over all angels and authorities and powers. Paul talks about this in Ephesians 6. Your battle isn't against other people. It's against these authorities and powers of another realm. Jesus went to proclaim victory over all of that for you for me, for us, for everyone, even for the people who died before the flood. That brings in Noah. In the scripture in Noah, there's a, a very sobering verse. It's Genesis 6, 5. The Lord saw, the Lord saw that human beings on earth were very wicked and that everything they thought about was evil. Whew. Yeah, that sounds like now. Not you guys, but that sounds like the world we live in. That sounds like the news. That sounds like the entertainment we watch. It sounds like what we're drawn to, that everything we thought about was evil. That everything we thought about was bad. Get fast forward to the New Testament. Paul writes, the payment for sin is death, but God gives us the free gift of life forever in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's because of the resurrection here in a week. It's because of the resurrection that all this is possible. We're going to drive this home next week. But that resurrection means that we can place our trust in Him. It's that we're not really sure if we want to leave our place of comfort. We're not really sure if we want to leave our habits. We're not really sure if we want to leave this thing or this person or this circumstance that's familiar to us even if it's not working. Like Noah's family. It wouldn't have been comfortable. Might have been forced. <laughs> you get, things are getting awfully wet and awfully deep. I think it's time to get on this boat we've been chastising you about for the last 120 years. Luke, 1 John 1, 7. If we believe in the light as God is in the light, we can share fellowship with each other. Then the blood of Jesus, God's Son, cleanses us from every sin. All of the Bible, this is the fill in the blank, all of the Bible points us to the truth that God loves us. God loves you. Jesus died to offer salvation to us, and He is faithful to keep His promise to all who believe in Him. He's faithful to keep that to you. 
John 14, 6, no one comes to the Father but through me. Acts 4, 12, Jesus is the only one who can save people. No one else in the world is able to save us. All of us have sinned, and unless we accept what he did for us, the world doesn't want to hear it. Our pride doesn't want to hear it. Unless we accept what he did for us freely, not by payment, not by action, not by talent, we accept what he did for us. If we don't, we're forever separated. The Bible doesn't tell you that to judge you guilty. It tells you that to warn you, just like you would warn your child, just like you would warn your loved one, don't go there. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life. God's wrath remains on them. On that first Palm Sunday, that first Palm Sunday, Jesus went where only He could go. Only He could go. Hear that. Jesus is the only one who could do that. It couldn't be a sinner for a sinner. That doesn't work. It had to be the sinless for the sinner. That's the only way it would work. Jesus went where only he could go. And on Good Friday, this coming Friday, Good Friday, he paid what only he could pay. Only he could pay the debt for you and me. Only he could do it. Nobody else. And on Easter Sunday, he did what only he could do. God the Father accepted his sacrifice for anybody and everybody who would accept him. Adrian Rogers had a great quote yesterday. It was yesterday's devotional. I had to sprinkle it in with a pen. And then I didn't write it down on here. I wrote it on the other. We're accustomed to saying Jesus died for me. Jesus died for me. For all who would accept him, Jesus died for me. But instead of the word for, put in the word instead of. Jesus died instead of me. Jesus died instead of you. Instead of everyone who would accept him. Jesus died instead. He gave the best. He, God gave the best he had. The most he could give. So that Jesus could die instead of you. Instead of me. If you missed any fill in the blanks. Or I did. Christians are not working to obtain a relationship with God. We are giving, sharing, and working because of our relationship with God. The second fill in the blank under where believers go, everything about heaven will be beyond anything we can imagine. Where did Jesus go? <laughs> All who die having accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior are eternally secure in God's hands. And what believers know, all of the Bible points to the truth that God loves us. Jesus died to offer salvation to us and he is faithful to keep his promise to all who believe in him. Please, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you. I, I, I feel so miserably shallow. But thank you for everything. For the life that you gave, for the time in this world that you gave, for the opportunity that you gave. If you just wanted to save us, you could have killed us at birth. All little babies are in heaven. Please know that. I can talk to you about that later if you've never heard that before. But all babies are in heaven. All innocents are in heaven. All before the age of accountability or unknowing good from bad are in heaven. That's the way it goes. That's the way it works. That's what the scriptures say. Most of us in here are not in that window anymore. We know good from bad. We know right from wrong. And Lord, we know we've been bad. More importantly, we know we are bad. We call ourselves good. We call ourselves good because we did something good, but... Deep down inside, we know we're not good. And deep down inside, we know we're separated from you. And maybe today's the day that those who are watching online or somebody here in the sanctuary, maybe today's the day we connect those dots and say, Lord, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I am sorry for the things I've done and said and thought. I'm sorry for what I've been. Save me. Please save me from me. Save me from me. Save me from this thought, this addiction, this habit. Save me from this pathway. Save me from this separation from you. Save me from me. Come into my heart. Come into my life. Start molding me and shaping me and changing me. I'm not saying you're a genie in a bottle. I'm not saying you're an insurance policy. I'm not saying you're anything other than the Lord, the authority, the master of my life. That is all. And that is enough. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
your, your voice will be the only music. Please stand and join us in our closing hymn. Father, we do thank you. We pray that you will go with us. We pray that you will be with those who are outside early in this week and those who are traveling and absent from church today. We pray that you will be with those who are watching online, that you would send us out away from this service different somehow. It's a mixture of emotions. We want to be joyful and we want to be happy because we know Easter's coming, but at the same time, this week is just so horrible. It's so painful. We don't we don't like watching those images. We wince at the, the crucifixion pictures and the crucifixion message and the crucifixion pain. We don't even like going there mentally. We don't like to think about it because we know each and every wound was ours. We don't ever want to entertain that thought. But at the same time, we're so thankful we're so thankful for all that you are and for all that you did that everything that needed to be done has been done if we will just accept you I'm not saying this world is ever going to be right but this world is as close to hell as the believer is ever going to know that our future is brighter than we could even imagine so Lord help us to proclaim that message help us to shine that light help us to deliver that hope to a world that so desperately needs you they don't need us. They don't need another fix. They don't need another tonic. They need you. They need your word. They need your words. They need your life. They need your light. So reflect that light through us. Send us out with your word and your words to say the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. For that man or that woman or that boy or that girl that doesn't have peace, I pray, pray that blessing. We pray that blessing upon them right this moment. Father, send us out. Lead, guide, direct, and protect us until we can meet again. If anybody needs prayer, please come forward as Pastor Joe is forward. If anybody needs to be prayed for or over, please come forward. Otherwise, send us out until we meet again, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.